May that one protect us both. May that one nourish us both. May we work together with great vigor and energy. May our study be illuminating. May we not unnecessarily cavil with each other. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. We have one question here locally. It's a simple question, but a question that is practical, one that impinges on all of us. What is peace of mind? That's the question. And along with that question might be a subsidiary question, how do we get it? So that might be of concern to everybody because one of the most sought after things is relieving stress. And why is it so common a subject is because in a frantic, frenetic world where everything is busy, where there's a lot of noise, we find it difficult to keep quiet and to remain isolated. One of the difficulties of the COVID virus is people have had to remain in isolation and many people find it extremely uncomfortable because we are essentially social creatures. We want to be with the, re with the herd. <laughs> Sorry, Swami, could I just add into that question? Could you yeah, maybe please. touch off some um, renunciation, non-attachment and basically not getting too caught up in worldliness? I think a kind of similar vein. Oh, okay. Not asking too much, are you? <laughs> <laughs> so that's okay. All right. But let's find out what is the cause of lack of peace of mind. And uh, of course, we have to understand what is mind as well. But today, people lack it because communication has become quicker, vaster. Social media has become the normal media. So our social interaction in a sense has become more frenetic and we nobody likes to be quiet so the, the urge to do that is not just social at the bottom of it is to try to find some form of belonging or some form of enjoyment some form of satisfaction and of course, we know that that's not the, a lasting formula. If it was a lasting formula, that would be the end of the subject. But it's not the end of the subject. People are perpetually looking for this. Now, we are told that in order to meditate successfully, a precondition is required. Peace of mind is required. To get peace of mind, self-control is required. So that's the whole formula there self-control what do we mean by self-control we have to understand what is the composition and geography of the mind so the mind is a kind of field where we can observe many many kinds of activities but all these activities are stimulated from our, our external experience what we see what we see what we hear what we touch and our reaction to it if it is not handled carefully, it will be inefficient. So let me just read this comment, by the way. This is interactive session, so uh, so there's a, a comment in the chat. People say that our mind is monkey and it's difficult to tame it. Yoga teaches us to see thoughts as it comes and goes, but never get attached. How can we, how can one achieve it without meditation? All right, okay. I'll try and combine all these answers to all these questions. They're all interrelated. So first of all, what is the mind? What is this thing called the psyche? It is something that we can observe, there's no doubt. 
described here in an uncontrolled mind is like a monkey mind. Now we have the story of Rama. And in the story of Rama, we have Anjaneya or Hanuman. Hanuman is a monkey. And so if we take the interpretation of this and we say the mind is like a monkey mind, disturbing, jumping all the time. And the example is a monkey is restless by its own nature. So last year, January 2020, we were in uh, on our way to Utukamund, yeah? and we happened to stop. And uh, there was a group of monkeys having a nice uh, interaction with tourists. And they were obviously interested in having a picnic. But if you watch a monkey, you'll see it's continuously scratching, it's alert, it's looking out everywhere. And that's the nature of all wild animals. All anim wild animals are looking for self-preservation. So if we use that analogy and are serious about the analogy, we have to say that the behavior of the mind is associated with our own survival. A kind of strategy going on but we are unconscious of the strategy. That means we leave the mind to its biological devices and that makes us no better than monkeys. So the monkey mind is described like this, that it is restless by its own nature. What makes it restless by its own nature is it's continuously reacting to the external world and part of the mind are the senses. By the senses, we don't mean eyes, ears and so on. These are just the organs, but by the real senses, we mean the internal senses that play when we are in a dream state or when we get a, a visualization, a memory comes back, we can reconstruct it all. In meditation, for example, we can reconstruct whole scenes. We can even heighten them like a Walt Disney picture. Green, we can make ultra green. Blue, we can make ultra blue. So we have, uh, a, whether good or bad, we have a photographic me memory. Some people say photographic memory is an absolute, almost perfect memory. But we all have a photographic memory in the sense that we all recall scenes. Scenes of experience that get replayed and experience associations are there because we're continuously absorbing information and we're continuously using it for, to, for learning purposes. Even from a baby, we start doing it. In two years, a baby has learned a complete language. By the time you get to adulthood, you ask somebody, please learn uh, a new language. They'll have to go to Rosetta Stone or something, one of these, um, uh, one of these language learning courses and so on. And it seems difficult for us to do it. But the mind can learn many things very quickly. And we were discussing before here, the section of the brain called the hippocampus. It's shaped like a seahorse. That's why the name is like that. Hippo means horse. Campus means the sea, seahorse. Shaped like that. And we know that it has uh, the capacity to be a configurating mechanism for us to express memory, access and express memory. That much we know. Exactly how it works, we're not exactly there yet, in my understanding anyway, but we know that there are certain sets of neurons and these neurons can be replaced. If you ask, do you believe in reincarnation? Yes, because every cell is expending energy and living and dying and being replaced constantly. And the whole action of metabolism and taking in food and converting it to energy, that's taking place all the time. And all renewal is taking place. Every seven years, they say that the whole body is renewed. So this restless mind is to do with survival. And the survival is because we want to react and maintain the external uh, our relationship with the external world, thinking that we are an individual separate from it. And somehow 
we have to coordinate with the biological response of surviving and even thriving. The thriving part we do through procreation. May it all pass on to the next generation through genes. But the current thing, eating, drinking, and so on, reacting and making sure that everything is not a threat, threatening to us. So if you are in the African bush and you're, you have some baboons there or something nearby, that kind of monkey species, if you look them directly in the eye, they'll either, they'll, if they're in a group and they're confident, they will attack you. It's the surest way to be attacked. And they, if you look away, then they're fine. They'll sit right by you. But if you look at them directly, you're in trouble. The mind also has to be dealt with in this way. So you have to do some indirect thing because underneath the mind is this whole layer of experience, which is the unconscious mind. It's the unconscious learned behavior that is operating. But you can't deal with it directly. You have to do it in a, in a clandestine way, as it were, in a roundabout way not an obvious way, but just as if you want to make friends with a dog or a horse or a, a monkey in the wild, don't look at it directly. If you want to make friends with a dog, you put your hand out, you let it lick it, lick it, smell, smell, look away. It's looking at you sideways. And then you gradually smoke, stroke it behind the, now it's quite confident. You're not a threat. You're a friendly, a friendly type. So how to train this monkey mind is exactly in the same way. And the example of the monkey mind goes further in its turbulence. How does it go turbulent, uh, more turbulent than that? Well, the monkey gets uh, drunk with the wine, wine of desire. It's desires that upset the mind. What is a desire? A feeling that there's a kind of absence of something, incompleteness in me a kind of internal gap and fulfillment has to take place from the outside. I have to fill it from the out to the in. It works with any other case. If I'm hungry, I seek food and put it in. If I'm thirsty, I seek water and put it in. So it's all seeking satisfaction from the outside. And the mind has a different diet. If you make desire its diet, then it's disturbing to it because every desire stimulates something in me that wants more, it's like adding fuel to a flame. It's like trying to put out a fire by adding kerosene. It doesn't work, won't work. It'll enhance the fire. It'll make it more fiery. So that's not a good idea. So control, self-control is necessary. Then of course, the monkey gets stung by a scorpion. We are stung, our pride gets stung. And then it gets possessed by a ghost. So jealousy, pride, desire, all of these come in. And they will come in in any species, biological species. How do we refine the mind? We become an engineer, we become a Hanuman. But what is the secret of the monkey Hanuman having the capacity to jump over an ocean, being completely strong, being so self-controlled that it accesses power? First of all, we have to have faith in ourselves. The Holy Vedanta tells us that real atheism is not disbelief in an external God, that rules from outside. No, atheism is an absence of belief in yourself because internal to you is only one entity and it is always full, it is always free, it is always perfect, which means we then have the capacity to watch the mind and see it in its different states and then to assert our control on it but more importantly, to manifest this perfection and divinity from within you. And we don't do it by dragging the mind down. 
if we don't do it by criticizing it and weakening it. So there are two th sides of the coin. One is to assert your strength, not to get dragged down by any guilt or undue self-criticism, not to say I'm a worm, I'm a sinner. That's all weakening. Or on the other side is to say, you are a worm, you are a sinner. We take the positive attitude, always take the positive attitude. That doesn't mean to say we don't make a correct assessment. What is the status quo of the mind? So you can see how a monkey can be transformed into a Hanuman with all the strength, recognizing its own strength. And in the story of Rama, where does the whole drama begin? It begins not on the earth, it begins in the heaven. Because Hanuman is the son of Maruti, is a Marut, is the son of the wind. And what does wind stand for? It stands for your unlimited power. In you, you can move a mountain. With that confidence, with that assertion, you then go and tackle this thing called the mind. So how to get peace of mind? Katu Upanishad will tell us. First of all, you need self-control. That means controlling the senses. That aspect of the mind that is reactive because all our energy is going through the sense organs. When you do that, you are preserving energy. And that makes it practical. Vedanta is useless if it is not practical. It has to be practical. And the most practical thing we can do is to conserve energy. So I gave an example earlier on here. Nearby, uh, by the local library, there is a water wheel. And a small stream comes and tips over the edge and catches a kind of bucket arrangement that forces the wheel down and what makes it easy is the wheel is easy to turn because it is on bearings, on an axis and bearings. So there's no friction. All the friction is taken away. And a small trickle of water compared to the size of the wheel goes and moves the whole thing around. It's a huge wheel, moves it round. That has the capacity to do work. What is energy in the old definition of Isaac Newton? Something that has the capacity to do work. Force is what they call it. In Swami Vivekananda's time, there's no term for energy. They call it force. So you apply a force to something, depending on the force and depending on the, also the resistance and the mass and all those other things, Things work mechanically. Thought is a force. Thought is the most important, significant force that you have. When you apply it, you can move anything. You can mobilize anything. Because unlimited power is in you. You just have to know it. So what is spiritual practice? Number one is assert the power that is within you. Assert your own divinity. This is Vedanta. Vedanta says there is one thing in you and that is unlimited. And you are that. And it's expressed in this phrase, Tattvamasi, that thou art. You are that. That we have to learn. Once we learn that we are the master, then there's an example of the chariot contain not only Bhagavad Gita, but Kautu Upanishad. These two are closely linked. So the body is like a chariot. And the horses are like all the sense organs. They want to move in different directions if they're not controlled. If you don't catch the rein and steer them, then they'll go all over the place. When the energy that we call thought is not deliberately steered, in a specific way. That is in moments when we are not occupied with specific activities. 
moments where there's an absence of subject within the mind, at those moments, we have to catch it and deliberately steer it. Otherwise, the horses will go all over the place. We can't allow it for a single moment. In spiritual life, there's no holiday in spiritual life. We have to be constantly alert and see what is the condition of the mind. So what do we call the mind? The mind is a field in which there are permutations and oscillations and configurations going on all the time, constant activity, classified in three ways. There are moments when you know, I feel very really lazy. Then we joke, you see, you want the maximum number, maximum amount of sleep. What is that? Five minutes more, particularly in winter. Uh, let me leave, leave it a little bit and so on. Let me be a little lazy. What's the harm one day being a little lazy? The problem is the next day you'll also feel it. After three, three, four, five, six, they say 10 days is required to form a habit. We assume therefore 10 days is required to lose a habit. And then it's gone. And then you need to change something radically. Otherwise, the mind settles into it. This is a state of inertia. The whole of nature has this capacity for inertia. And when we see it on the earth, we're talking about the iron core of the earth. We're talking about rocks. We're talking about earth. We're talking about clay. We're talking about stuff that doesn't seem to move. So peace of mind is not this and can be easily misunderstood as this. Peace of mind means let nobody disturb my peace. No. All this Vedanta philosophy was taught in the midst of the height of activities. It was taught by kings, not by people in forests or caves. And the king was not the, you know, uh, constitutional monarch who stands aloof a kind of constitutional monarch or a president, not like that, actively engaged. There could be nobody busier than a king in the ancient days. And all this wisdom comes out. That's what makes this Vedanta practical. This comes out in a lecture that Swami Vivekananda gives in London in 1896. He gives a series, Practical Vedanta. Is the first part of it. And he mentions this fact. The Srimad Bhagavad Gita, which is the greatest summary of the Upanishads and commentary of the Upanishads, is not delivered in a cave. It's delivered on a battlefield. You couldn't get anything more potentially turbulent. Nothing more active than a battlefield. And all these kings were busy day and night, day and night, day and night in all their various activities. So how do we, in the midst of our activities, manage to stabilize the mind, not by blanking off, not by sleeping, not by withdrawing, not at all. So that's one aspect of the mind. The other aspect of the mind will be intense activity. You know yourself, one day you feel highly energetic. You want to move everything. And that also creates disturbance of the mind because it's future orientated. And anything that is future orientated, that is not handled well, will create disturbance in your mind. It will create anxiety. And the cause of it is, comes back to the penchant for the mind to survive. The individual must survive at all costs. And therefore, it is thoroughly selfish, egoistic. The highest values in Vedanta will be, please be unselfish. Please don't associate with this individuality, which we call a human. Please dissociate with it and associate with your true nature. Your true nature is full and free and perfect. There's nothing to change in it. It is always there. When we are concerned about somebody who is ill, let's say with cancer, then the temptation is, what advice will I give them? How will I change them? 
Well, if you can lift a helping hand to help somebody, so be it. If not, fold your palms, says Swami Vivekananda, and leave them. Wish them well, but always try to see the perfection in them since you see it in yourself. If you see it in yourself, you'll understand there's only one thing there. There are no separations anywhere. Automatically, you'll have the sense of oneness everywhere. That will be your highest ideal. That ideal is called Sattva. That is the highest, noblest ideal. So you have to play a constant game in the mind of promoting Sattva. That is what is meant by self-control. Self-control gives you peace of mind because although Sattva is also a, wave, a series of waves in the mind characterized by complete selflessness engendering the highest ideals of truth and purity and love and goodness and harmony. Insert those values when the mind is not occupied in any, with anything in particular. Search the files of your memory and bring out something that is elevating. Shuffle that around constantly and feel the inner joy that you can never get from the outside. You can only get it from the inside. Those moments where the spirit gets elevated in a sense of joy. Let me just take this away here. All right. Somebody's calling me conveniently. It's all right. So to take any instance like that and insert, prepare the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind, as I said before, you can never tackle directly. It always has to be by conscious input all the time. If you have an instant, if you have an opportunity to think of the highest ideals and feel this internal joy, why don't you do it all the time? Why do you only leave it for select moments? The opportunity being there, you can elevate it, at least in moments where the mind is not specifically occupied with anything in particular. At least in those moments, you can fill the mind with something useful. An internal kind of painting you can make, an internal kind of poetry you can make, an internal kind of song you can make. In this way, you'll create a new counter habit. And what happens? Because we are thinking that the mental field, which is technically called chitta, that this chitta, this mind stuff, is in a state of toimura, what you call the monkey mind, you can calm it nicely by inserting these values on the basis of your own internal strength, your own internal perfection, your own sense of oneness. So in that same lecture, Swami Vivekananda says, in the old days, people thought atheism was lack of belief in God. But actually, if you leave God out of the picture, it is actually lack of faith in yourself, your internal self. Catch that first and then assert it and select all these elevating thoughts that can be there in the mind bring them out of God's filing office, called the unconscious, ruminate on them, elevate the mind, and gradually, bit by bit, you'll reform the habit level in such a way that this sattvic element will be natural to you. And promoting the sattva waves will have the neutralizing effect, neutralizing the disturbing waves of rajas and tamas. That means every activity, every work you do, will be done with a sense of calmness. People make a mistake. They think that work requires anxiety, agitation, and huge amounts of energy input. No. Energy is a mechanical term. I should say efficiency. Efficiency is a term. It's an energy term. Put it that way. You can say efficiency equals 
an output of energy over input. And what that means is, just like the water wheel, you can put a little bit amount in, in a measured way, in a concentrated way, in a systematic way, and produce a maximum output. But what wastes the energy? Anxiety wastes it. Anxiety wastes it. Anger wastes it. Resentment wastes it. Scandling wastes it. And any deviation from the truth will waste will be a waste, actually. So we can pick it up actually from the lecture I mentioned. Somewhere I have it. I'm picking up in a random way from this uh, practical Vedanta. All the powers in the universe are already ours. It is we who have put our hands before our eyes and cry that it is dark. Know that there is no darkness around us. Take the hands away and there is a light which was from the beginning. Darkness never existed. Weakness never existed. We who are fools cry that we are weak. We who are fools cry that we are impure. Thus Vedanta not only insists that the ideal is practical, but that it has been so all the time. And this ideal, this reality, is our own nature. Everything else that you see is false, untrue. As soon as you say, I am a little mortal being, you are saying something which is not true. You are giving the lie to yourselves. You are hypnotizing yourselves into something vile and weak and wretched. The Vedanta recognizes no sin. It only recognizes error. And the greatest error, says the Vedanta, is to say that you are weak, that you are a sinner, a miserable creature, and you have no power, and you cannot do this and that. Every time you think in that way, you, as it were, rivet one more link in the chain that binds you down. You add one more layer of hypnotism onto your own soul. He continues, therefore, whosoever thinks he is weak is wrong. Whoever thinks he is impure is wrong and is throwing a bad thought into the world. This we must always bear in mind that in the Vedanta, there is no attempt at reconciling the present life, the hypnotized life, this false life which we have assumed with the ideal. But this false life must go and the real life, which is always existing, must manifest itself, must shine out. No man becomes purer and purer. It is a matter of greater manifestation. It's a wonderful statement. It's not that you are impure and you have to be purer and purer and purer. You are simply manifesting more and more and more. And all of us are doing it, you see. Every creature is doing it. And when I say every creature, every creature indeed, not just man, every creature is moving and manifesting. One thing manifesting through all these so-called adapters. You have to have the concept of adapter, or a technically called upadi, a limiting adjunct, limiting the all the potential on the one side, seemingly in the way, but you see on the other side, it's manifesting like a light bulb, it manifests light. But at the same time, it's stopping the fullness of the electrical current complete, manifesting this, this way and that way. What is the sun? The sun is that one entity manifesting through the adapter, which is a, a 
uh, a, an activity of hydrogen. What is the moon, a manifesting adapter? What is the human body, a manifesting adapter? What is man? Man is a multi-purpose adapter, manifesting all the time, something like that. So, the Vedanta recognizes no sin. The Vedanta always says that not only can this be realized in the depths of forest or caves, but by people in all possible conditions of life. We have seen that the people who discovered these truths were neither living in caves nor forests. He's referring to the Punishats nor following the ordinary vocations of life, but men who we have every reason to believe led the busiest of lives. Men who had no command, who had to command armies to sit on thrones and look to the welfare of millions. And all these in the days of absolute monarchy. And not as in these days, when a king is to a great extent a mere figurehead. Yet they could find time to think out all these thoughts, to realize them and to teach them to humanity. Oh, I have no time to do this spiritual life. I have no time to sit down and meditate. I see. Okay. Why? Well, I don't live in a cave or a forest. I don't, I'm not like you, I don't live in a monastery. I'm an active, busy person, always busy. I get up in the morning and I say to myself, look in the mirror and say, I'm a busy person. I have no time for anything. Well, maybe you do have time for some things because we all have time seemingly for complaining, for diverting the mind into other things. Thinking that we require a holiday, we deserve something. And this is deservability, false deservability um, idea that diverts the mind away from our central manifesting purpose. Some people have been kind enough, says Vivekananda, to start an anti-vivisection society. He's, he's talking about, he goes on to talk about an anti-vivisection -vivis society that was created and he's challenging them. So do you think that dissecting animals and eating animals will be different. See, one is used for science, but one is okay for eating. It must be the same all across the board. So it goes on like that. Then he goes on, take the idea of sin. He says, I was telling you now the Vedantic idea of it. And the other idea is that man is a sinner. They are practically the same, only the one takes the position or the, takes the positive and the other takes the negative side. One shows to man his strength and the other his weakness. There may be weakness, says the Vedanta. We don't deny it. But never mind, we can't, never mind, we want to grow. No point in giving somebody a lecture to say how weak they are. You have to encourage them to grow. Disease was found, well, disease was found out as soon as man was born. Everyone knows his disease. It requires no one to tell us what our diseases are, but thinking all the time that we are diseased will not cure us. Medicine is necessary. We may forget anything outside. We may try to become hypocrites to the external world, but in the heart of hearts, we all know our weaknesses. No point in laboring them. But says the Vedanta, being reminded of weakness does not help much. Give strength, and strength does not come by thinking of weakness all the time. The remedy for weakness is not brooding over weakness, but thinking of strength. Teach men of the strength that is already within them. Instead of telling them they are sinners, the Vedanta takes the opposite position and says, You are pure. 
and perfect and what you call sin does not belong to you. Sins are very low degrees of self-manifestations. Manifest yourself in a high degree. This is the one thing to remember. All of us can do that. Never say no. Never say I cannot. For you are infinite. Even time and space are as nothing compared with your nature. You can do anything and everything. You are almighty. So these are the principles of ethics. He goes on like that and so on. Emphasizing that Vedanta is to do with your own inner strength, your own perfection. It's not something to get. It is already there. It just has to be manifested. And the wonderful ex expression he gives. We cover our eyes and say, it is dark, it is dark. Well, take your hands away and you'll see, ah, there it is. It is all there. So what are the mechanisms by which we close our eyes to reality? And then we make a mistake and we create a reaction which is binding to us. It is to think that there are people and places and events and individualities in space and time in front of us. And that is the border. Not to go beyond that border and see, ah, Lord, you are there full and free and perfect. Begin with yourself and then extend to others. And when you find it in the depths of yourself, this is called meditation. You can do it by yourself, but with eyes open, you can see the withinness everywhere else also. That has a transforming effect. And it is that transforming effect that becomes practical Vedanta. So you are controlling the mind with minimum energy and effort by being efficient, not wasting energy by diverting the mind into selfishness, anger, greed, hate, etc. They're the waste of energy, anxiety. When you see a person working in an office, he comes back and says, let me relax. I feel so tired. Well, what did you do? Supposing such a person enjoys playing soccer. On the soccer field, he's much more energetic, much more tiring physically to engage in a game of soccer. And yet he's more tired sitting in the office doing work. Why? Because while he's sitting there, he would rather be playing soccer. Instead of putting all your energy into the unit activity and sublimating it as a divine offering with an understanding of the inner perfection in everything. That is called Karma Yoga. There is something here. So it says, I have a question about the knower and the known. The knower of the field is the same as the known as you explained in the talk about the know the field, like a dreamer and the dream, but if we try to study our own mind, we need to be different than that. That is apparently not possible. The hard problem of consciousness, could you explain what Vedanta says about being in control of our own mind without knowing it? No, but you know, what do we know? We know the external reality, as we call it, which is related to the senses, so the relative reality. And we know the relative reality of the mind. Both of these constitute a field. And the only reason why we are able to know it and acknowledge it is because we are the knower of it, this independent entity. So we are observing these things within the field. If we couldn't do that, we couldn't change it either. Going back to the analogy that uh, Krishna makes and is also there in Katupanishad of the chariot. I am the charioteer and I'm holding the reins of the intellect and steering the horses and going into a certain chosen direction. So if, uh, if there was no distinction like that, it wouldn't be possible. The whole of self-control 
is on the basis that I am an entity that is able to see where things are going, assess it nicely, evaluate it, and make an, a, an administrative or an executive decision about a direction. That makes me a knower, knower of the field. That knower is consciousness itself. So how do we get peace of mind? Coming back to the original question, we get peace of mind by, first of all, understanding what is the cause of the disturbance, asserting peace creating thought that translates into peaceful activities. Doing it so systematically that the underlying condition of the mind is always contented. Contentment means I have nothing to add or take away from it. It is always in a state of equilibrium, but not the kind of equilibrium of, pee, of sleep. That is dead because that doesn't give us anything extra. It doesn't give us any knowledge or enlightenment. All it does is it's, it's quiescent, that's all. Otherwise, if it was only a matter of that, then all the rocks, all the clay in the world will all be illumined. That's not the case. So it is play, to play that game of always understanding what is the condition of the mind at any given point and putting something in there which is elevating to the mind and has a neutralizing effect of all the other disturbing components which are there. This is the secret of Hanuman taking his own strength and using it, you see the analogy of son of the wind. It means then that I'm relating my omnipotence, just as the wind is found everywhere and can mobilize even houses. You can make a hurricane from the wind and blow off roofs of houses, uproot everything like that. Knowing that, knowing your own nature, you can mobilize anything. Strength is unlimited, infinite. Seeing that a person like Jesus with that kind of wiring, as I mentioned maybe yesterday, the blind see, the lame walk, the dead wake up, this is your potentiality. You are all prophets in that same lecture as Vivekananda says, you are all prophets. Right at the end of the lecture, he says it. We'll try and catch that last piece. He says, do you know from the history of the world where the power of the prophets lay? Where was it? In the intellect? Did any of them write a fine book on philosophy on the most intricate ratiocinations of logic? Not one of them. They only spoke a few words. Feel like Christ and you will be a Christ. Feel like Christ and you will be a Christ. Feel like Buddha and you will be a Buddha. It is feeling that is the life, the strength, the vitality, without which no amount of intellectual activity can reach God. Intellect is like limbs without the power of locomotion. It is only when feeling enters and gives them motion that they move and work on others. That is so all over the world and it is a thing you must always remember it is one of the most practical things in vedantic morality for it is the teaching of the vedanta that you are all prophets and all must be prophets the book is not the proof of your conduct but you are the proof of the book how do you know that a book teaches truth because you are truth and feel it. That is what Vedanta says. What is the proof of Christ and Buddhas of the world? That you and I feel like them. That is how you and I understand that they were true. Our prophetic soul is the proof of their prophet soul. Your Godhead is the proof of God himself. 
If you are not a prophet, there never has been anything true of God. If you are not God, there never was any God and never will be. This, says the Vedanta, is the ideal to follow. Every one of us will have to become a prophet. And you are that already. Only know it. Never think there is anything impossible for the soul. It is the greatest heresy to think so. If there is sin, this is the only sin. To say that you are weak or others are weak. All right, so we have five minutes to go, and I hope that shed some light on the subject, and hope that it covered a whole range of questions. All right. Uh, Swami, just a quick question. When Swami Vivekananda said basically not to, you know, relate to being a mere human, when we take the position of child with our deity, I suppose, is it looking at yourself as a divine child rather? So not the human kind of child, but a, a divine child of God. There are two types of children, the whining type and the, uh, the, and the innocent type. We want to be the innocent type, not the whining type. We want to be childlike, not childish. These are the two types of children. You can think of it in this way. Think of yourself as a divine angel that came here for a purpose, to fulfill a divine mission in a non-egoistic way. And the complete lack of self-consciousness is where is that of a child, isn't it? So there was an amusing incident yesterday. Yesterday, a devotee here and myself, we climbed a hill. I don't think you'd call it a mountain. It may have felt like it, but it's about two, two and a half kilometers climb upwards and then downwards also. The pattern of life is what goes up must come down. So as we were coming down, a, a small girl said, spontaneously said, oh, I like your skirt. That was to me. <laughs> I was wearing a dhoti. So I said, thank you. I said, but it's not exactly a skirt. I was amused for a few minutes at least. The innocence of a child, the spontaneity of a child. How beautiful, how wonderful. That sweet innocence is where we should position ourselves. So we are the divine child. And when we relate, of course, to our personal God, that is leading us to the self-discovery of our own pure consciousness. Thanks, Swami. So that everywhere we look in nature, we can see if we put ourselves in a condition, a position of a child, then everywhere we look, will be the mother. The whole of nature will be a nurturing thing, looking after us constantly. We call it mother nature. We'll be in the same condition as a, a constantly delighted child who sees with fresh eyes every new scene and claps their hands. What a joy at the small things. All right. Okay, so we leave it there. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Oh.